All right, what I'm going to do is get started. And hello, my name is Jason Broughton. I was the former <laughs> state librarian for Vermont and commissioner for the Vermont Department of Libraries. And I can mention my new title, which is I am currently um, sadly and belatedly had to leave Vermont to now be the director of the National Library Service um, at the Library of Congress. But again, I still miss Vermont is all I will say. So welcome to the 20th annual Brattleboro Literary Festival. Again, I'm Jason Broughton, and I am going to be the moderator of this panel. Thank you for attending. You can submit questions to the panel via the Q&A button on your screen. And if you need a little assistance, just let us know. We're, we're here to kind of help. If your question has already been submitted, click the thumbs up icon to upvote the question. There will be links in the chat to purchase the book and to donate to the festival. And a special thank you to our sponsors. We look forward to a robust discussion. With that, I'm now going to transition a bit and in a sense introduce just by name and I'll let each presenter kind of talk about themselves as we get started. The name of our event today is Why Black Books Matter. And of course, our discussion presenters are going to be Gloria Edom, W. Ralph Eubanks and Farah Jasmine Griffin. All right, hopefully again, everybody can hear me and to kind of start our discussion on why this is such an important topic. I will start off with a series of questions. We might go into some deep discussion based on the items. And with that, we will start off with our first question. And each author is then asked to gently kind of, you know, discuss a little bit about yourself in a couple of minutes. But the first question is, what does literary success look like to you? Again, the first question and give us a little bit about you before you answer that. Thank you. And I'm going to start with Miss Farah. Well, hello, I'm, I'm so thrilled to be here. I've been looking forward to this panel with my fellow panelists. Um, I am by profession, a professor of English and African-American studies at Columbia University. Um, literary success, what does it look like? I think every time I um, get a notice from a reader that they've read my book, that they've actually taken the time to read something I've written, that feels like success to me. Um, and it doubles, that success doubles when it's a second reader or a third reader. Um, because I think that you write, you put your ideas out there, you hope they're received, um, but you don't know, you're putting them out in the void. So I am just really appreciative for readers um, who read and take the time to let me know they've read. That feels like a real literary success to me. Well, thank you. I will now move on to Mr. Eubanks. Well, um, I'm a writer and editor. For many years, I was uh, an editor. I edited the Virginia Quarterly Review and author of two books, three books, um, most recently, A Place Like Mississippi. And I would have to say that literary success for me looks a lot like it does for Dr. Griffin. It is people who read and comment. And it's not just the people who like what I write. It's also the people who don't like what I write, where we actually in, engage in some type of discussion or, or dialogue and go back and forth about the ideas that I'm going to, um, to get across in a piece that I've written or, or in a book. So that's really, for me, that back and forth with, with readers, as well as people actually reading and commenting. Thank you. We'll now move on to Glory. Hello, everyone. I'm, I'm so excited to be part of this panel. And I have to agree with both, both panelists regarding what it means to have literary success. So I'm the founder of an organization called Well Read Black Girl. And our mission is to really broaden the experience and the engagement and understanding of the Black experience through literature. And so success for me looks like being able to promote diversity and cultural expression, being able to really highlight its beauty, um, and having readers read the books like I'm again I'm really excited to be here because I have been devouring Farah's book like it's so oh, incredible <laughs> it, it's it's just so it really is the essence of what one should be doing when they're trying to achieve literary success they should be reading until they understand and they should really be taking the 
um, the ideas into implementation, you know, really embodying the things that you read. Um, and so that's what success looks like for me. Well, thank you. Now that we've gotten, as I call it, the nice questions out of the way, for those who really know me, I like to jump into the heart of the matter. So let's start off with, in a sense, not exactly why we're really here, but to discuss how important it is that you are here and the other types of books that will expose people to different worlds, as I like to say. So with that, what can Black authors do to help white readership understand their books? With that, I will start with Mr. Eubanks. Well, you know, it's, I was thinking, I have been thinking about that question a great deal. Uh, and in thinking about it, I think about my fellow Mississippian, Kiesi Lehman. And what Kiese uh, often says is that I'm not necessarily thinking about trying to attract white readers. I'm not, you know, I think that was, Richard Wright felt that need that he had to. And I think his editors also forced him into that in the way that his books were, were edited. So in writing about the black experience, I want the person to kind of go along with me. And I really don't care if, if I'm getting across the white reader as much as I am that they are trying to put themselves where, where I am. I'm not, I am thinking about audience. I think every writer does think about audience. But am I thinking about necessarily reaching a white reader? No, I can't say that I am. Um, do I hope that they read? Yes, um, but I'm not necessarily, in, in, if I'm writing about something that, that is a reflection of my blackness, I want that to come through and I don't want to necessarily think about who is going to engage with it. Thank you. Laurie, what do you think? I agree 100%. You know, I was really fortunate to go to a historically Black college and that shaped the lens. I went to Howard University, HU. Like it, it really shaped how I perceive the world and how I encounter the white gaze. I don't think it is the priority for one, for Black authors um, to, to fixate on that because it can, you know, take you away from your mission and your goal and your work, right? Like it becomes really distracting if you're constantly thinking, about what, who, how the audience is going to respond. And I also believe that there are really deep structural changes that are occurring in the publishing industry and in society throughout. And that's another reason our mission is, so, is more urgent than ever. It's like, we need to really operate with the belief that literature can be deeply transformative um, and it can uh, reflect the diverse cultural perspectives that we have in society. And if people walk into the space with that perspective, um, I think we will have a more, uh, more engaged readership. And it, it's not necessarily about simply, you know, trying to address the white audience. It's about just addressing each other and dress humans. I, it, actually, your question made me think of Margaret Walker and just how much of a humanitarian she was and how her, you know, concept of just like being human with one another. Um, so I think that is what Black authors and writers, editors, you know, the whole gambit that what uh, we're striving for. Well, perfect. Thank you. And to round it out, Farah. Yeah, I agree. I couldn't agree more. Um, with, with what my fellow panelists have said. I, I think that, you know, I'm a reader and um, I have read writers of every race, every nationality, um, just because I love to read and I want to learn from the books. And um, I don't expect them to be teaching me something when they're, you know, that they have to teach me something. Um, they just have to write the best book they can write and I will read it. And I have enough faith that there are white readers out there who feel similarly about works by black writers. And um, thankfully, you know, uh, as Ralph said, Richard Wright had to do that. There's a whole slew of writers, you know, the slave narratives had to do that. Um, they cleared the way, they paid the price. And fortunately, I don't feel that um, we have to do that anymore. We just have an obligation to write our truth and hopefully write it well and readers come to us. And yeah, that's what I really enjoyed about your book is that it was unapologetically black. 
but also unapologetically human. Yes. Right. That was, and it was that humanity that really captured, captured me in reading it. Well, you know, it's funny, Ralph, let that you have a um, beautiful, I guess it's an epilogue um, where you're talking about parchment prison and you, you have that poem by Etheridge Knight there where he talks about the common denominator between the white woman who comes to visit him in prison is that they're human, right? That trying to look for a common denominator where there already is a common denominator and that's that they're human. And that is one of my favorite poems. I was so happy to see that you worked with it there in that. You know, when you, you guys are talking about this, this leads me into a wonderful question. I have a lot of things I would ask <laughs> you guys to know. But this gets into a little bit of the essence of who you are just right after what you just both stated. So what was an early experience where you learned that language and or the power of place and geography had power? Because I definitely know from the three of you, there is power that is residing in your work and coming from that. Well, what shaped your experiences to say, hey, this is me and I'm onto something here. But also, if there's geography, what does that look like? Because I know what it looks like to come from South Carolina. I know what it looks like to live in Vermont. I know what it looks like to be a Southerner in a Northern city, how that plays out. So talk about that and let's start with Glory. Um, I would say for me, it was really embodying my, my Nigerian heritage. I'm first generation. Yeah, both my parents are Nigerian. I was born here in Washington, D.C. And um, for the longest time, there was a, a little bit of friction with that, especially as, as I was a teenager. And it, as I was like reading, you know, very ferociously, just trying to understand, because I really wanted to understand the black experience. And my father kind of sat me down. It was like, we are of the diaspora. Blackness looks like a lot of things everywhere. So we can go travel to the South. Because even like the idea of going to like to the South, like I was like, we, I want us to go to the South. And my dad was like, we are from Nigeria. I can take you to a trip to Alabama to see like, if you want to go down, you know, but that's not, you can, uh, you can understand and have appreciation for both. And so I try to bring that into my work that blackness is vast and it's so expansive. And I, that idea that my father planted in me as a young girl was really amplified when I went to Howard because you go inside campus and you have folks from the Caribbean and you have folks from Nigeria and you have folks from Chicago, Oakland, and we're all united by our blackness. And it just brings us together in such a beautiful way. Um, so that, that was like my first understanding, like between like reading Morrison and reading Chidawa Achebe and understanding the civil war, but also understanding the Biafra war and making those comparisons and understanding how, um, you know, how slavery, at one point I was like really obsessed with trying to find like my ancestors from America. And again, my dad was like, that's not gonna happen. <laughs> like he's like, we can read narratives like, for you to understand that, but it's like we 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 aren't. There's not gonna be a census for you to find the person that might have come to Virginia, you know. Um, but my curiosity and my like longing for that understanding was always there, and to make those connections and to make people know that um, again, there's a vastness to language and dialect like read, reading about like the Gullah Gullah pe folks and reading my like my data uh, my, my parents are ethic which is actually a very small tribal group in Nigeria most people know like Igbo or Yoruba my my tribe is smaller than that you know so um so all of that like understanding my background reading books to understand just like the American experience being an American myself being born here was really crucial to just um my understanding of language. I think I answered your question, but yes, you did. <laughs> okay. I was going to talk about. I mean, the diverseness of. I remember when I was younger, hearing the word Chocolate City, you know, which is D.C. For our, our listeners who might not know that, yes, that includes our white brethren and, and the vanilla, if you want to call it. But Chocolate City is what you call D.C. For those who do not know it, but I'm growing up with that term, Atlanta was not far behind with that. And when you talk about place and geography, I do hail from a very unique perspective from South Carolina, which means I come from a little area called Cross, which is closest to Charleston, but you're talking about what people don't even understand, even in Black culture, Geechee and Gullah, which I can definitely get into, but that's a whole nother conversation we don't have right. time to discuss. So with that, let's go to Farrah and talk about that question on, when did you learn about the experience of language and the power of geography along with that? So I think the, um experience of language was um, several things. One, you know, children, Black children playing, you know, there's often wordplay in our games. Sometimes um, 
it can be very hurtful, <laughs> you know, it can be, and I think, you know, to the extent that it, the teasing and, and play that children do struck me that, wow, these are just words. These aren't like people fighting. These are just words, but they're hurting people, you know, so there's a power there. Um, hearing poets like the last poets and Nikki Giovanni, not always knowing what they were saying, but just that there was something magical that seemed to happen when they spoke, um, I think was the first time I became aware. And then on my own reading, you know, and falling in love with somebody like Morrison did it. Sense of place, um, Philadelphia is, you know, is very important to me. I grew up there. I don't live there now. I live in New York, but it's very important in the book that I've written. Um, it's a character. And it wasn't just the city itself, but sections of the city. And I think when I first realized how important place was, was discovering different sections of the city that I grew up in um, that made for a completely different experience, um, different black neighborhoods, different class neighborhoods. Um, that really gave me a sense, even as a kid, that place was really significant and important. Thank you. Mr. Eubanks, to round it out. Well, I would, you know, I'm from Mississippi, although right now I'm talking from my house on U Street in DC. Um, but I would say that for me, it was reading William Faulkner. When I was 12, I took a copy of The Reavers off the bookmobile that came to my house in rural Mississippi. I wanted to see the movie, but it was rated M and I couldn't. So I got the book. I didn't know what a bordello was when I picked up the book, but I figured out what it was by the time I was finished with it. And that book <clears throat> really introduced me to, to the work of Faulkner and to his town of Jefferson. When I went to the University of Mississippi in 1974 and visited there for the first time, I was accepted, but had never visited the campus. I got off a trailways bus in Oxford, Mississippi, walked up to the square and said, this is Jefferson. I knew the place right away and I looked around and I said, I guess this is where I'm gonna be the next four years, but I could see Faulkner's characters there right there in that moment. Um, after I'd shoved my copy of The Great Gatsby that I was reading on the bus there, that's you know, a completely different place, but then I was back in the place where I'm from. And I think it was reading Faulkner that made me realize that Mississippi was a place worth um, writing about. It's not what I did as an undergraduate. I, I was a student of, of James and the Victorians. Uh, I was a big fan of Anthony Trollope, but I really, you know, as a friend, my friend Steve Yarbrough told me yesterday, I was the least likely person he knew as an undergraduate to write about the South. Oh, so. wow. That's quite, quite amazing to hear. <laughs> so, my goodness. What I'm going to now do is try to disperse questions from the audience throughout our conversation, which I believe I can be successful at as opposed to waiting to the end. And that allows us to take on a, a different dynamic. Uh, one of them will be quite interesting when I ask it. So from um, Andrietta, the question is a really nice one. Are you in the habit of re reading books more than one time? And do you come to a new understanding each time you read them? I, I can definitely say personally for me, when I read a book, you're saying, yes, you start to find things. And then you're like, why did I miss that? Or you were like, well, you know, that wine has now worn off from last night and I see it in a different light. So <laughs> that's all, you know, mood and, you know, food and conversation does change things over time and how you see things. But for each of you, what does that look like? Do you read it more than once? And when you do so, do you come to a different level of understanding that? So let's go with Farah. So, um, wow, that's such a great question. And yes, there's some, there's some books that I do not read again. <laughs> I read them and I'm done. Oh, that's, do you want to tell us one? No. That you were like, <laughs> there are many books that I read and reread and um, absolutely. Some of them I, I've reread three times. Some of them I reread 10 times and I, absolutely learn something different, see something different, experience something different. And um, often those are books by black writers, but not only black writers. So I'll just give one example. Um, I reread House of Mirth by Edith Wharton a lot. I don't know why, I just do. I, I've, I've always loved that book. And I see something different in it every time. And sometimes I remember when I read it and I realized I was the protagonist, the same age as the protagonist. And that 
I was connecting at the age thing. Um, and before she'd been someone who was older, who I looked to, you know, oh, I, that's what it means to be that age. Um, but yeah, so I experience those books, all of them differently every time I reread them. It's a different experience. All right, Glory. Yeah, that's such a great question. I am definitely a big rereader. And I think it's, for me, books have been so therapeutic. Like, for example, I recently reread The Color Purple and I was thinking about uh, motherhood and I, I'm a new mom, I have a toddler now. And so I've been thinking just about, um, you know, Shug and Seeley and that sisterhood and how the idea of mothering and how one can be a mother in so many different ways. Like you don't only give birth to a child to become a mother and this idea of caregiving and because the color purple when I first read it you know in undergrad was such like a, a hard experience for me like I was just hit with just like the um the violence of it and I think this the rereading it I needed something to like take me away from the, the day-to-day caregiving of my, of my little one but also to be like really immersed in the story and that is what I was like I hit the second time or actually not even the second I probably like the fourth or fifth time reading it, I was just hit with the mothering aspect of it. So I think like at different phases of your life, different ages, like you see different things. Um, I also, um, I read the book Bird by Bird a lot by Anne Lamont. I, I'm like, you know, in the midst of like working on different projects. And I just love like using that book as a resource and thinking about just like sentence structure and how to like formulate a narrative and tell a story. And so I, I just, it's just a, such a slim, you know, go-to book for so many people that uh, things like that, like I love things for just like the emotional connection, but also using books as just like a steady resource. And I'll say one last thing, cause I, cause I actually have like a book on my desk. There is a series series by um, University of Mississippi that has like conversations with uh, Sonia Sanchez, a conversations with Tony oh. Bambara. I I have every single one, like every author, <laughs> you know, and I was actually just rereading the one with Tony K. Bambara um, recently. So I love anything that has like, it's, you know, it's like the original Twitter before everybody was online, you know, like actually reading a book and hearing their words and going back, like reading collections of Q and A's. I love to do that. Um, uh, you know, Bomb Magazine also has like a good archive of that, the Paris Review, you know, so I tend to go back into archives and reread a lot of conversation pieces. Oh, perfect. Well, Mr. Ralph, to round it out. I'm a rereader as well. A lot of times I'm, I'm teaching a book, I read it again, and, and a book I return to quite a bit is Virginia Woolf's To the Lighthouse. I have a, on this shelf behind me, I have a very well-worn copy, my copy from graduate school that has my marginalia in it. And the last time I read it, I noticed that my daughter had read it. Now it has her marginalia in it. So well, I'm seeing two different versions of that. Or when I teach Walker Percy's The Movie Goer, um, I, I teach from the version that my wife read in college with her notes from um, a book, a, a, a course that she took at the University of San Diego called um, I think it was called Stories of Faith and Fiction. I and mean, I teach a class on faith and fiction and I use that book in that class. But seeing her notes about Walker Percy at that time, which is, I have to say, is a very difficult book to teach now to young women because there's so much sexism in the book, but I kind of lean into that. Um, but I love reading, rereading those, those books that I'm, when I'm teaching. And last, last, a year ago, I had the, great experience of teaching Native Son in the wake of the Black Lives Matter protest. Oh, my and my students seeing um, the scene where Bessie is brought into the courtroom. And one of my students shouted out in the middle of it, that's like Breonna Taylor. And I had never thought about it. And the way that they, watching them kind of see that book in a very different way, a book that many of us see as very problematic, but teaching Native Son a year ago and rereading it a year ago, you know, gave me, I, I realized that Richard Wright had really captured something in that book uh, that made me think about his work in a very different way. Well, thank you. And I'll round up with mine, but just would simply be, I'm not an author like you, but um, rereading The Bluest Eye over 30 years has been quite interesting. Read it in 1996 um, as required reading and looking at the African-American perspective 
Uh, Gloria, you should know that while we are not enemies, I am from FAMU, former Rattler. Uh, so that is interesting as well. But um, reading it and then it, in the early 2000s and then reading it last year showed a very different level of things in a variety of different ways. But that's a whole different conversation on believing that you can be another race. And if you only had these eyes, it would be really perfect, along with what does that look with fashion and culture and a whole other thing of saying, well, if I just wear this, I can be that. And it's like, no, your problems are still there. You just look better, but your problem is still there. <laughs> whole other conversation. Well, Ralph, you hit on something that our next, I would say, question comes from Bonnie that would be very interesting for the three of you. Again, we're getting to some really wonderful, as I call it, nitty gritty here. So Bonnie asks, and this is a bit of a long one, hearing you talk about language, I wonder what you think about the novels of Zora Neale Hurston. Again, I love Sarah Fondaswani, a whole different conversation. Who uses dialect that I've heard some or many black people find offensive. As a white person, I've read Zora's language as something that's culturally and historically and geographically the deep south in the 1930s relevant and interesting. What do you think about that? Do we as a diaspora feel that is offensive when we hear it? Um, Ralph, you kind of talked a little bit about that and saying that um, contemporary versus historical does have an interesting um, turbulence right now when people read things. So let's start back with you on that thought. Well, I really am not bothered by Zora's use of dialect at all um, because she was an anthropologist. I mean, she was really thinking about that. and. The, way, the use of dialect in their eyes were watching God um, makes me realize the type of people that she's she's writing about. You're you're in their lives. You're hearing their voices, and I I think what's maybe what's happened as we as black people have gotten farther away from that. Um, from people who really were unlettered, as my mother would say. Um, <laughs> and hearing those unlettered voices, we cringe at hearing it. And I think here listening to Zora, I have to embrace it. Uh, I mean, I have to really um, embrace that. It's interesting, my white students will never read aloud from their eyes for watching God, um, mm. because they say, I don't want to, I said, you know, it's not a dialect I know anything about. Yet they understand the dialect and they want to, they want to understand why. And very often I find myself ex explaining that, but they, they really do, they do get it. And I don't find it offensive. I think that it's just something that's very real Probably. from that time. Farah, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I don't find it offensive at all. And um, I, I find it actually quite beautiful. Um, and I often teach it along with her characteristics of Negro expression. One, to show her as a um, anthropologist going out and gathering material. And, and what she says about that essay is an essay on Black aesthetics. And then the um, novel is kind of a practice of those aesthetics. Um, and I sometimes will share with my students stereotypical use of black language like that's really racist, racist and offensive that even could have been um, predated Zora or coincide along with Zora. And I'm like, this is offensive language. Um, Zora's taking the vernacular and finding the poetry in it, um, giving us the metaphor and, and that that's actually quite beautiful and quite artful. And so um, sometimes I, you know, the teaching moment is having, this is, this is what's offensive. <laughs> um, and, and Zora's language is not, it, it's quite the opposite actually. Thank you. Glory. Yeah. I agree with both panelists. It, and, you know, there is a tinge of respectability politics that comes in when someone is critiquing the historic and what I found absolutely beautiful language of Zora Neale Hurston. And she's having such a revival within the last like two years. A lot of her unpublished work is coming into this into the space, and people are revisiting her work. Um, I think it is important for us as 
everyone mentioned, not to, infl- you know, conflate those two things on, you know, looking at stereotypical language and understanding that it is of the essence of the time period she was writing in and adding context to that and knowing the history. And I haven't found, um, I haven't found anything that people necessarily find her work of- offensive. Um, yeah, I'll leave it at that. I, I love Zora <laughs> 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 Well, for our listeners, I also want them to know, um, coming from the state of Florida, um, there is a Zora Neale Hurston Festival that you should consider once the pandemic goes. Um, I remember when that really was taking place again in the 90s, seemed so, so, so relevant in the 30 years ago, when I remember being told, hey, we're trying to do some things here. And if you have not thought about traveling to that, just know that there is a Zora Neale Festival in the state of Florida that you would want to consider because she did reside there for a while. But Glory, in picking up on something you said, now let's unpack this weird box called, how do you handle literary criticism as compared to other black authors, as compared to mainstream authors, as compared to anyone else? How do you take on and handle literary criticism and do you think it's fair? Glory. Oh, you're on mute. What I was saying, that, that was probably the universe telling me to calm down. I, um, I think that it's, you know, fairness is a big word. And I think there is a lot of pressure placed on BIPOC writers, particularly Black writers, to educate and inform and use our, our space as um, a learning tool and not fully appreciate it for its quality and its beauty. And I think I welcome literary criticism. I think it should be uh, something that is definitely encouraged. There should be lots of discourse and lots of conversation about how we can uh, just widen the canon. You know, we have the greats, we have Morrison, we have Walker, we have Maya Angelou, so many wonderful people. Um, But the, you know, time is moving and there are so many new contemporary authors that are coming into the space that deserve as much, you know, recognition and support. Um, So I welcome it. It's from my perspective, what I'm what I'm witnessing, it's it's challenging in terms of the industry because there's so many marketing tools and there's so many like social media. I, I am the reason I've had my success is because of social media, but I often note that it's only one tool and one tactic to get information and visibility. It is not the only. We, I encourage people to read deeply, to go into the archive, to really, uh, if I recommend one book, you should be reading their whole body of work and doing your own diligent research. Um, in terms of criticism, I can recall, I'm having a memory of just like reading reviews of early Morrison and uh, Walker's work where it, it was like demolished in like places like the Times and the Washington Post where people didn't understand the, the nuance of it and really like gave bad reviews to these two iconic writers, right? So who, who are the critics and what are they saying? And are they giving, do they understand the history and the nature of the work to even like, to do the critique, you know? So I'm like, I look at all those things and I'm very mindful of giving things like a 360. Like, where is it coming from? Who is the writer? Why? What is, what's happening in the world to influence it? Um, and I feel like every writer and every reader should do that due diligence when they're critiquing or sharing things. Um, yeah, it's really it's really complicated, but I we need it. We need more criticism, especially from BIPOC editors and uh, crit- critics. Perfect. Let's go with Farrah. And to your point, you know, I think the word in the street is when that happens, it's usually, and here you are coming out of the cut, which means, all right, <laughs> you about to get jumped on in a second. I got a critique, which is quite interesting, coming out of the cut. So Farrah, your thoughts? Um, well, I'm a literary critic. <laughs> so um, I, I, I certainly believe and hope that there is um, important work and writing to be done in the area of criticism. Um, and, and that's both kind of scholarly criticism and what we teach our students to do in class and also the whole review culture. Um, and, and reviews are very important for authors. Authors need to be reviewed so that people will read them. And I would just encourage a more diverse set of reviewers. And I hope that publications would, would make use of a more diverse set of reviewers and that reviewers um, realize that that they also have to have um, a background. They have to have read deeply, um, have to have thought deeply. Um, 
that that it's not just a matter of a kind of crude thumbs up, thumbs down. Um, and I think I've been starting to see that something as simple as like Publishers Review, well, Publishers Weekly and Kirkus Reviews. Lately, I've been looking at them twice and I'm, I'm thinking, hmm, that's a reviewer that actually got this, which I'm not used to, but they got it. Who's that reviewer? Um, and so I think that there is some growth and something exciting happening in the area of kind of contemporary literary reviewing. Um, and certainly that is the case with literary criticism as well. Thank you. Ralph. You know, with uh, literary criticism, I, mean, I, I think like, um, like Farah, I do write, I do some reviewing, I do some, some, some criticism. I'm very careful in my reviews to, um, because I realize the work that goes into writing a book. And if I'm going to be critical of that book, I want to do it in a way that is fair. I don't want to uh, really go at the reader with some personal or ad hominem argument about, about their work. So that's something you know, for me as a reviewer, that's my position. The hardest reviews I've ever written are negative reviews. And because I want to be careful about it. And you know, as far as criticisms of my own work, I've learned to have to take that on, on the chin and just realize how people are looking at it. There's you know, criticism that's been made of a place like Mississippi that I look at Mississippi far too much through the lens of race. And my reaction that is, well, maybe I do, but how else can you look at Mississippi? There is no other way. We have placed that lens on ourselves in so many ways. And what I was hoping to do was to get people to see Mississippi as this broader representation of America. And there is this tendency for Mississippians to think that you are criticizing, criticizing something about Mississippi. You are criticizing them personally, particularly white folks. And I just kind of take that with a grain of salt. I don't let it bother me, it's just kind of dust that off and, and move on. That's what you have to do. Uh, and, and as I said, because I you know, kind of believe in being fair, I believe that the kind of, that comes back to you. And, you know, it, what goes around comes around. Well, thank you. Uh, we, we could talk all day about, um, my goodness, when I was in Vermont, I used to have these wonderful conversations at the state librarian with a lot of New Englanders who said, what do you mean that there is a Southern order? And I said, oh yes. One of the things that people in South Carolina, all the way from Maryland, all the way down to Texas, and people forget Texas is Southern, we unfortunately always grade each other. And the sad result, Ralph, is as you know, will say, thank God we are not like Mississippi or Alabama. Because unfortunately, they are always on the bottom of some list, education, finance, welfare, just an amazing amount of that at the bottom. And I know a lot of people find that stunning to realize that the South has a pecking order when it looks at itself sometimes to say, thank goodness, we are not like so-and-so. But that's a whole different, wonderful conversation. Yeah, that's, it, a different, that's a totally different conversation. Yes, yeah, totally different. <laughs> we, 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 yeah, we could, we, could, we could do a whole Mississippi panel, but that's not what we're here for. <laughs> and looking at what each of you just said, there is a question um, that I'm going to kind of get to in a moment, but let's start it off with this simple question. Um, do you feel that authors of color are underrepresented in the publishing world? And if so, what is your viewpoint on what might be needed to not have that be so the case? I will just start. Uh, as someone who worked in the industry for a long time, you need black editors. Um, we need black people in marketing um, and marketing and sales, um, black booksellers. I mean, it's really kind of all through the network. Um, in my years working in publishing, very often I was the only person of color in the room. Uh, and, and sometimes in trying to sell a book, the challenge was um, someone saying, well, we already have a black book. Oh. Um, and that's the thing that, that comes up a great deal in, in the industry. And, or thinking, well, we can only have one black book a season. 
And I think by having more people of color in the industry right now, that is, that's the, that's the solution. That's always been what's, what's been needed, I think. Oh, perfect. Farah. Um, yes, I absolutely agree. And, and you know, I, I think that on the one hand, I, I was thrilled that so many books by Black writers um, were being published and read and made the bestseller list. But, you know, I, I just wish we didn't have to have, you know, catastrophe <laughs> for oh. this to happen, right? That we don't, like, that um, these writers are always writing and they, they come from a tradition of wonderful writing and that can teach um, all Americans a great deal. And we don't, and in fact, um, can help us perhaps, you know, maybe avoid some of the pitfalls that we um, experience if we take those writers seriously and their insights seriously. So I think that I would love to see more attention given to black writers, publishing black writers, reading black writers that doesn't require black death, you know, for that to be the case. We, and I would agree, we need, we need so many more. We have wonderful white editors, you know, without question, I have an extraordinary editor, but we need more black people at the table, more black editors. To hear Ralph say he was the only person in the room and knowing that 30 years ago, 40, 50 years ago, Toni Morrison was the only person in the room, you know, um, that's just a real problem. So the industry really should take a look at itself. Well, thank you. I will want to, before we get to glory, I remember reading a really interesting article of New York Times that said something to the effect of when black people are in the street, white people start picking up books, you know, book clubs start forming. And I thought that was a very interesting thing to actually understand and hear. And I had a wonderful white colleague who said, this is true in Vermont. They just said, that was it. They said, this is very true. Yes. And we had a wonderful discussion on that. But if you, anyone can look that up online, you can find it as an interesting item. Glory, your perspective. Yes, as someone who has a very active book club, I overemphasize that the book is just the beginning and you need to figure out how to read and also implement. So how, when you read something, how, how can you take that into your own community, your own library? How do you impact policy? And how do you look to your neighbors and offer more empathy and a, and a clearer perspective of what uh, how they might be impacted by this. So the book is, it's wonderful start a book club, but it's useless if you don't actually have dialogue and talk to black people, <laughs> like you gotta actually do the work. You know, the book is just one tool in your toolbox. Um, and in terms of just what we need in the industry and how publishing needs to change, I deeply believe that everyone has something to contribute, contribute from the author to the editor, to the reader. And if there is just more mentorship um, in terms of guiding future generations of Black writers and giving them access and resources and making things more equitable. Um, also, the, the editors, 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 when you think, you know, you get behind the scenes and look at the acquisition process and look at the marketing team, sales, all those things go into play. It is a very interconnected web behind the scenes before you even get a book in your hand or on the bookshelf. So uh, having more BIPOC um, Folks in the in these rooms making like really powerful decisions will make a difference, and we'll see that in for future generations. I mean, it's amazing when we look at the National Book Award finalists. Like you know, we have people like Sarah Broom and Elizabeth Acevedo. Like so, I mean, Jason Reynolds. They're incredible people that their quality of work is chef's kiss, just like perfection, right? If the work and the talent is there, it's just like, make fix finding these pieces and, you know, putting the puzzle connecting together. Connecting them. Yeah, connecting them, just more connection. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, but it's, it's a, it's complicated, but it's non-complicated. It's like, how are the people? <laughs> like, you know? Well, I have a question from Tina and um, let me go with her comment. When we talked about reviewing, she said, I encourage emerging writers to review, even if in a local newspaper and we deserve literary criticism is what she said, but she has a question. This one, I want to kind of preface with a little comment um, from myself in the sense of, I uniquely know when there are questions that we all should look at from a humanitarian perspective. Sometimes it is important for those who I consider bystanders, men, allow women to have that conversation, whether it be black women, white women, Hispanic, 
um, Asianic, a whole host. So this question is a bit unique. And Ralph, I, I kind of preface that so you can get yourself together. Do panelists find established writers, especially women of color, supportive of this new burgeoning generation of writers? And you can see why I preface that. That's a conversation for women while men are on the sideline. We can critique, but sometimes we just are in the room and that's it saying, let women talk on this. And that's how I felt. So Farah, your thoughts. Well, you know, that question comes from a really gifted, talented, wonderful writer, Tina McElroy Ansa, um, who we all read and, and admire so much. And because of her own practice, um, which is, just uplifting writers uh, all the time, my answer to that question would be yes. Um, she herself, you know, um, is always uplifting younger writers and she's very active on social media. I find that those writers of an earlier generation who are active on social media um, are engaging with younger writers, whether positively or negatively, are engaging with them. Um, and those are the writers who I see the most um, offering support, offering sometimes constructive criticism. Um, but yes, I, I think that I think that an earlier generation of writers is supportive of a newer generation of writers. I see it. I see it all the time. Oh, I'm gonna add this in real quick then before I go on to you, Ralph, and I'll let you answer real quickly if, if you want. She says, "Do younger writers feel this support, or do you think younger writers feel this support?" I think some of them do. <laughs> some of them, some of them do. Some of them might not feel it, or or actually might be the subject of a harsher criticism. But uh -huh. um, Tina herself models, I think, something really beautiful. All right, Ralph. Um, you know, I've had the great privilege of uh, being an instructor in the Hurston Wright Foundation Summer Writing um, Workshop, and. During Writers Week, one of the things that I have you know, tried to do as an instructor is to follow up with my students. I want them to, to write. You know, I remember the first time one of the students said, I wasn't sure how I should address you. I said, I'm just Ralph. You know, it's just like, and, you know, you, there's, you know, there's no pretenses, but I wanted to make sure that they all knew that they could, um, that I was gonna support their work. Um, the joke at Hurston right by the end of, of the week was that I wasn't just Ralph, I was Uncle Ralph. So I was trying to be, you know, so it was, and I still hear from those students and they all, and it's always dear Uncle Ralph. And so I'm always trying to, to really mentor and support other young writers, particularly black writers. That's perfect, glory. I think, you know, I do believe that there is this new wave of emerging writers that feel the support. I definitely see it in my community, whether folks are meeting together to do like writing, writing workshops or attending the festival together. There is an exchange of like nurturing and affirmation that's happening. I think it's sometimes it could feel intimidating because one must sometimes they feel like do in order to be a good writer do I need to have like a huge social media presence and I think those things can be distracting and take you away from the act of like writing and so you know before you start thinking about followers and Twitter and this and that like the focus should be primarily your writing and I, I just want to chime in and say like I read Ugly Ways I'm like you are you are the queen thank you for just being here and being in community with us like there's just there there's so much space for more fellowship and more, um, especially in the space of like a workshop, workshopping. The questions I get often around are around like, how can I workshop my work without being in academia? Not everyone can go to Iowa. Not everyone is at Columbia or, you know, or it's, it's there are so many great institutions that I love and I, but not everyone can do that. So what are the alternatives? And as you mentioned, Hurston Wright is a, a incredible program. I adore Marita Golden. She is a mentor of mine. Um, so looking at other alternatives for people to really strengthen their work and be in community and, and think about uh, peer to peer and instead of like looking up to see like who's made it and how I can like be in contact with them. Who are you like writing with in the coffee shop? Who are you, you know, for, like the, my friends that I've made at college and we have 
transformed together and grown together and our successes have been aligned together, you know, so really looking at amazing people that are your peers so you can grow and elevate each other's work. So, yeah. Oh, Thank you. We're going to shift a bit and we're going to move to a different perspective. We're going to look at YA for just a moment. So from Bonnie, any comments about needs for BIPOC, Black, Indigenous, people of color? And again, we can have a whole conversation on that acronym because I know in the Black diaspora, that is a conversation going on right there. But I'll leave that to the side too. Uh, multicultural books for children and young adults. From my perspective, what's available is greatly improved over the last decade, but what more can be done? What do you think can be done to have more diverse or particularly multicultural books for children all the way through the YA section? Let's go with Ralph. Well, I mean, it's almost as if I, I want to turn that around to the librarian here to, to you know, think about how through libraries we begin to introduce that because we, for the YA space and also for the adult space, we have the, you know, the, the issue of censorship. And that is, I think that is going to be the issue of our time as we have people who don't want to discuss issues of race. We are in danger of having, not having these diverse books actually getting to the children who should be reading them. I agree with you. Um, the American Library Association, which I am a member, I'll dis disclose um, for a long time, does publish every year the banned books list and actually recognizes banned books week. And I think a lot of people, if you are listening, would be surprised to know what books are on the list. Of course, which should not surprise you um, whether you are religious or not. For example, the Judeo-Christian Bible is on the list. So you should know for a fact, nothing is withheld. <laughs> so we can we can talk about that a whole nother way too. Because the Bible is on, yes, the Bible is on the list. So that lets you know what you're dealing with. Now, Farah, your thoughts on YA and multicultural books. What more could be done? Well, I agree. I mean, I think it's it's um I I, I think that there it's much better than it was. Um and I collect children's books. I love them. I read them. I, I, I pretend that I'm buying them for the young people in my family, but I buy two copies because I keep them, you know, they're beautiful. Um, and um, YA is something that I've just only recently started reading um, and, and learning from the writers who write YA young adult um, works and how diverse they are, you know, um, and, and how sophisticated and, and what difficult topics they deal with, which I think is just extraordinary, but we need more writers of color. And I think that there are more established writers of kind of adult, so-called adult works who are now moving into and writing books for children. Um, you know, I, I've noticed that uh, several nonfiction writers who have books that are coming out for young people. And so I, I hope that it's something that will continue to expand and, and continue to grow as a fan myself. Perfect, glory. Oh yes, I agree 100%. YA is such a dynamic uh, sector of literature, section of literature. And it's, I'm proud to say that the writers that I've worked with over the years, you know, I'm thinking of Nick Stone and Angie Thomas, uh, Jacqueline Woodson, they write in such a way that is persuasive and powerful, but it also gives um, the young readers space to have their own agency, which is so important to really address young people as their own little humans, allow them to make mistakes and decisions and, you know, formulate their opinions and the though the books that they're writing have complicated ideas you know they're not talking down or condescending by any means and it's really extraordinary to see that and when I think of the things I was reading as a young person I was obsessed with the babysitters club and sweet valley high you know and <laughs> I, I, I did do like I loved Mildred Taylor and Virginia Hamilton of course you know but those are like the only two exceptions that really had like a rich historical aspect and really like really um uplifted black culture culture but everything else was definitely like these like rl stein books which we also need that too like you know there's a balance of both but um i i love the complicated ideas that young people are encountering and i hope that continues to grow well perfect i will say that i had the honor of um interviewing angie thomas we did get to bring her to vermont virtually 
because of the pandemic. And it was just an amazing thing done between a variety of partners, the Humanities Council, the Department of Libraries, and the Vermont School Library Association. It was in almost every single high school because she was willing to do the next day for the students. And it was done by a panel of teens. What an amazing experience that was. Um, but yes, the hit you give is also on the banned books list. So just letting you know how that is. To, yes, yeah, I keep up with what's banned. People are always surprised. As we start to wind down, I'll, I'll, too. <laughs> <laughs> the two questions. This was a little bit, um, I would say, interesting in the sense of thinking about culture. And within this, you can take this wherever you'd like to go with it. And understanding what we call American culture, along with the various subcultures in those cultures, how has this impacted or affected your work? Because there are so many ways to look at it as a Black woman, an African-American male, a person of a certain age, the Americana of it all. What do you think that has done to your work, particularly even if you want over the last year? Let's start with Glory. Um. Well, you know, over the last year I was working on, or last two years, I was working on my second anthology. So it's coming out in just a few weeks on October 22nd, oh, oh October 26th. Um, and the focus on that anthology is really looking at Black girlhood through the lens of short story and understanding how it's so important to have like nuanced stories of young black girls that aren't perfect or stifled. They're just like able to be free and liberated. And I've been really contemplating on this idea of what black liberation means. We have so many um, incredible movement leaders that we can look to. Um, you know, I'm thinking of Ella Baker, you know, obviously Martin Luther King, which th there's in this moment right now, his words have been just distorted in such a such a challenging way. Um, so I'm trying to look on how do we preserve the true meaning of work, you know, whether it's in fiction or otherwise, how do we <clears throat> really emphasize um, world building and how we can create our own uh, her, our own stories. Like I I I'm going on a tangent a little bit, but I'm like really <laughs> obsessed with the, the, the archive, you know, how do we preserve the archive in a digital age um, oh. as, as things start to change and things are in the cloud or Instagram goes down, you know, what does that mean for future generations that are creating uh, bodies of art, whether books or otherwise. Content um, and where it is held, I see. Yeah. And who, and, and who are those gatekeepers, you know? <laughs> so, well, I can talk about that all day. He, he, even Ralph can talk about that. That we, we know right. what the are, but well, uh, <laughs> that's what's so exciting that we're talking to you and Ralph also has. I, I also like this whole time in my mind, I've been calling Professor Griffin and Professor Eubanks. That's what I've been. That's what I've been calling you guys in my mind. No. Um, yeah. <laughs> so I, um, I'm, you know, I'm thinking you both worked at the Library of Congress, right? So it's like how in that is in my like this the stable institution of preserving of work, you know. So mm -hmm. how do does one do that on a smaller scale in smaller communities? Um, so our stories are distorted and they're not used against us in, in you know, uh, on, like, because right, right now what's happening with Martin uh, Luther King's I Have a Dream speech and this, that, because of Twitter and things like that, I'm just like, like this, this is not, this is not the direction we want to go in, you know? Correct. Like, that, that takes us in a different conversation. Yeah, All right, completely. So, so, <laughs> so Ralph, your thoughts? Um, I mean, you mean really kind of where I've been thinking about um, yeah, Americana, our culture, and how does it impact your work or influence your work? Well, really, as someone who writes about the South, I think probably my obsession has been getting people to think about the South as part of American culture, not this separate land of American culture, but very much a part of it. Uh, I'm in the midst of working on a book on the Mississippi Delta, which I'm, interestingly enough, doing in Cambridge, Massachusetts this year. And I had a little bit of trepidation about doing that in that space. Um, you know, just steps from the Anderson Bridge where in The Sound and the Fury, Quentin Compton met his end. Um, so I think what I have been thinking about is how do you get people to think about the South not as another country, but as part of this country. And in writing about the Delta, that's really 
what I've been thinking about. And I'm, I'm actually very eager to get back to Cambridge tomorrow to uh, spend some time at the Schlesinger Library. I was in the papers of June Jordan on Thursday and discovered that June Jordan had made this trip through the Delta in 1970, so just 50 years ago, and found this amazing interview with Fanny Lou Hamer there. And mm -hmm. I am, I want to go back, I'm going to the Delta in a couple of weeks, and I'm going through to kind of look at where June Jordan traveled through the Delta and what it was that she saw from her notebooks. And now, I mean, think about the archive that Gloria's talking about. It's the archive is really leading me to look at a place I think I know really well in a very different way. How did June Jordan look at the Delta? And that is, um, that's something that is, she's, she was also thinking about it as part of America as well. And that 50 years later, we're still having that same discussion. And why are we still having that discussion? I guess that's, that's one of the things that I'm really exploring. I mean, I have a big whiteboard in my office and up on that whiteboard it says, what are the myths that keep us from seeing the realities of the Mississippi Delta? And the other one is, you know, what are the policy, political and cultural issues that have, um, that have kept the people of the Delta um, really almost, I don't, I don't know the word that I used on the, the whiteboard. I kind of, it changes every, every day. <laughs> so, what, 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 what keeps us from, from seeing that? I mean, it's, I was reading Susan Sontag's regarding the pain of others and realizing that we should never underestimate the power of human cruelty. And I think the ways that we think about the Delta is the result of human cruelty. Oh, uh, thank you for that. That, that. that is a really deep, powerful item. I just want to get Farah in here. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm so engrossed by these answers. I, I, I had an answer, but I don't know what it is because what you all have been saying has been so interesting. And thinking about Ralph, you know, I have just always been drawn to writers writing about the South. Um, and and thinking about your own work and 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 what you've done and what you say, I'm looking forward to this project that you're talking about, as well as like Clint Smith's new work and um, Imani Perry's got a book coming out on the South. I just think that the Southern writers and writers who focus on the South have so much to teach us about this country in general. I've always been fascinated. I've been the white writers who I was most fascinated by, even as a teenager, were Southern writers: Truman Capote, Tennessee Williams. Mark, partly because they were the white writers who wrote about race. You know, they would have black characters there. You could see black people. And the Northern writers, you might not ever see a black person <laughs> in, that, in that work. So um, in terms of your question, Jason, I was thinking of it as kind of our, our various intersectional identities. And the ones that are most obvious are, you know, our gender and our, our race and sexuality and class. But there are all these other sort of identities too. And um, so I find myself reading everything I can read on people who write about gardens because I love gardens and I love flowers. And um, so I'm, I'm, that's also one of my identities. I'm not a gardener, but I, I appreciate gardeners or people who write about walking. Um, and lately I'm really interested in ruins and I won't say more about why, but <laughs> there's a reason why, but I'm fascinated by ruins. Um, that is quite interesting. <laughs> and so I, that's where I'm looking. I'm looking on, you know, people who write about ruins. And I think partly it's just because ruins say to us that um, societies and civilizations live and die. They're born and they die, all of them. Well, all perfect. of them in history do. And what ruins do they leave behind? So Thank you. I, I definitely say on my end as a librarian, because of 2020 in a variety of ways, I've had some wonderful deep conversations with people when I was in Vermont and kind of had to reset some people on a thought because it was very like naive and someone said, oh, you, wait a minute, you, you mean the, the black experience in America is not? And I went, oh no, 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 there is a British black experience. There is a French black experience. There is a variety. And it was kind of stunning to me when this person didn't realize like, oh no, all of those are very different. We share some commonalities. But those are different experiences. You, you can't think that people in Great Britain are going to have the same travails that we have here in America. And they were kind of surprised by that. And I went, where am I living where I have to think about even discussing this? 
again, a conversation that we should be in a bar in. But as we close out, I have a question for each of you. If anything is to be remembered from our conversation tonight, what would you like us to understand as a takeaway about your work, you, and being a Black author, and why these books matter? Let's go ahead and start with Glory. Well, that's a, a great question. I think the takeaway would be, um, I would love for us to continue in person and virtually to nurture a culture of generosity um, that allows us to give more space to all writers um, and give them the, the space to tell their stories and tell the truth um, and do so with great love. Thank you, Farah. Wow, um, that's, that's such a beautiful vision. Thank you, Glory, that's really wonderful. I think I would like them to take away, read our books <laughs> um, and read, just you know, continue to read and, and, and also discuss, create communities of reading. Um, and Glory has done that beautifully, but I think that that's a model that we can do, that if you take away anything, um, create communities of reading and include writers who you like and want to talk to in those communities. Perfect. Ralph. Well, I would uh, have to echo what Farah said. It's, it's reading is, is I, I would like people to read. And I guess I you know go back to my favorite Henry James kind of um, thinking about Lambert Strether saying, you know, live all you can. It's a shame not to. I'd say read all you can. It's a shame not to. And that's what I, I guess that's the, the, the takeaway. I, I come to this not as a writer, but as a, as a lifelong reader. Well, thank you. Well, as we close, I want to thank each of you for a wonderful, spirited, and interesting conversation for our uh, attendees today. I would like to thank the Brattleboro Literary Festival for hosting us on why Black Books Matters, particularly it's really why Black authors matter in my question. And I will uh, sign off with this simple quote. And for those who know me, um, as a former state librarian, I love quotes. And this one was said by Maya Angelou, who I just love watching as well as reading. And she said a simple item that we should all think about, which is the following. Nothing will ever work until you do. Good night and have a great time and enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you. <laughs>